and lift our hands to the heavens. We will allow the presence of God to fill us this, in this place as we sing, I fix my eyes on you. I fix my eyes on you. The author of my faith casting aside every sin and every way. I fix my Yeah. 
As every saint will lift their hands and worship our true God. One thing I ask. One thing I ask. This one thing that I see. That I may dwell in the house of oh Lord my King. All the day. We're going to sing it one more time. The one thing I ask. One thing I ask. This one thing that I see. As we worship God with all our heart this evening, I want to remind you that you can spend eternity in the house of God, that when you can spend the rest of your life gazing upon His beauty, as you make that decision to give your life to God. All these days of my life. All the days of my life. I want to gaze upon your beauty. Seek you in this holy place. Amen. Let's worship God as his presence fills us in this place, gives us comfort and joy. We're going to continue worshiping God. We're going to sing, I'm going to see a victory. The weapon may be formed, but it won't prosper. Darkness falls. And acknowledge that everything that is good comes from. 
from God and we will trust them that he will keep the enemy at bay, that he will keep the darkness at bay with his light shining in your life. With the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. You take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn God, I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. Who the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see Worship and praise God this evening. Amen. I'm going to see a victory. Powerful, powerful. I'm going to take some words from, I guess, the newer generation. Whenever you, you know, try to do it on your own, do it on your own strength, you're going to take L's left and right. But once you put trust, your trust in God, he's going to help you, and you're going to see the victory. As long as we're faithful, God's going to move on your behalf. Amen. Welcome to the Door Christian Fellowship Church, where Jesus Christ is changing lives. We thank you for joining us this evening, online and in person as well. We have numerous prayer requests that we want to bring before our mighty and Lord and Savior this evening. We want to pray for Mark, Dela, Chuck, Susan, Zane, Cameron for healing, Duntons for finances, marriage, and vehicle. James for salvation and restoration, Craig for a new job, Anthony and for the Duncanville Schools finances, and Ms. Norma as well for her pregnancy, and baby Mikey, Montrese and Deirdre Bolden for healing, Norma's safe delivery, Michael's health, Juan Silva for miracle and moved to Texas, Chavez and Silva family for salvation and restoration, Bernie Chavez for healing, Stevie for healing and miracle, Kelly Silva for healing car and promotion, Martin Ramirez for healing and salvation, Ramirez family for salvation and finances and restoration. Julie Garza for restoration. Alexis is for finances and a house. Villapano Davalo, Davalos Moreno family for salvation and restoration. Joshua Davalos for miracle and conversion as well. Leo's job and Aguirre family salvation and Chris's salvation. Liam, Levi, Avery, Narda, and Alex healing and finances. And La, 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 Lavash. Rivoso, Miracle and Healing, and Chance Family for Salvation, and David's Job in Finances as well. We want to pray for the leaders of our fellowship, our DFW churches, all the new churches that are being planted as well. Our nation, our president, our military, our first responders. We want to pray for our mother church, our pastor and his family, and all the baby and sister churches as well. For God's guidance and just clarity to help us as well. If you came to church this evening... With a need, when a love lifted hand is a sign to God, telling God, we need you, Lord. We know you're a miracle worker, that you can open doors and no one can close as we put our trust in you. And if I can have my brother, Chad, lead us to the mighty throne of God this evening and open us up in prayer. 
Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, Father God, for this evening, Father God, to bring us here, Lord, in your presence, Father God. As we thank you, Lord, for your grace and your mercy, Father God, that you've poured upon us, Father God. We pray for every single individual in this place, Father God, that the Holy Spirit will minister to every heart, every mind, and soul, Father God. As we ask you, Father God, to help us, Father God, only through you, Father God, we can be redeemed, we can be changed, we can be fixed, Father God, from the brokenness of this world, Father God. As we thank you, Lord, for this evening. Heavenly Father, we come before your throne of grace, God. We thank you for your faithfulness, for bringing us here to the house of God. I'm asking for that pouring of your spirit to stir every heart, to be upon us in this time of service and fellowship. I pray that the spirit of God would stir our hearts. Lord, God, give us faith that would move mountains. I bind and I break every spirit of unbelief and confusion. God, as we contend for the supernatural, as we believe in you as a God that can do the impossible, for those who believe in you, nothing is impossible. Father, I pray, Lord, I speak life, resurrection power, God, healing upon all those right now in the hospital, those in need, Father. I pray asking God you would have your hand to intervene in their life, do a miracle, draw people to yourself. Tonight I pray that you would anoint the message and seal your word in our hearts. Bless this service and anoint it, God. We thank you as we give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. As we bless and greet one another, we're going to sing at the cross. At the cross, at the cross, where I first God, we want to welcome you out to the door. We're really glad that you're here with us tonight. All those that are joining us on live stream, we really appreciate you taking the time and tuning in with us. And I do have just a few announcements. I want to remind you tomorrow there is going to be street preaching at 7 p.m. Get with David. I believe they're meeting at this spot there by the QT on Camp Wisdom at 7 p.m. Uh, they'll be there street preaching. want to encourage you. Um, uh, if you're able to make it, I challenge you. That's right there is an opportunity uh, to share your testimony. And that's what we are called to do is, is preach the gospel. You don't have to be a pastor. You don't have. Listen, your testimony is powerful. Be a part of that. Let God use your life. Um, and uh, I want to tell you, you'll overcome fear there. Amen. God will give you boldness, and that's what the Holy Spirit is for, to give us boldness and to be a witness for Christ. We are last days preachers, amen, street preachers. In the, as in the days of Noah, when he would preach um, the coming judgment of God, listen to me, we're privileged. We are blessed. Jesus said that, that the prophets, uh, that those before, they wish to see what you see, um, and, uh, you know, I, and I know that today that where we're living, amen, it's just a blessing, um, uh, to be saved in our right mind in the last days. Um, uh, just want to remind you this coming Sunday, we do have a guest speaker. We have Pastor George Morales. He's from Cato, Texas, will be ministering for us. Um, and, uh, you know, he's uh, not only uh, a friend of mine, he's my brother-in-law. Uh, he was one of the second churches that got planted out, the third church that got planted out of our mother church. Um, they're doing a tremendous job there in Laredo. So I know that this um, uh, Sunday is going to be a great time of ministry and, and the preaching of God's word. And so you take some flyers, invite some folks out. We're going to have a great time there as we start our Sunday school at 10 o'clock. Um, 
prayer at 930 in the morning. And uh, let's remember prayer here at the building in the morning. You can come pray, lay hold of God. That's all the announcements that I have tonight. We are going to take the offering as the ushers come. We hit the mark 23 years um, since 9-11, since the day that America was under attack. And I was watching a, a little memorial uh, this afternoon. My wife was cutting my hair. And as I'm watching this, uh, tears begin to ball up in my eyes and, and just uh, it just brought back that moment. And, you know, and I'm thinking because I was there and if many of you were there, I mean, we weren't there physically, but watching it on live television. I remember seeing the buildings coming down, collapsing. Um, there I am, 15 years old, um, and I couldn't even comprehend what was happening. You know, because we see Independence Day movies, and, you know, we're, we're desensitized in America. We're very insulated. We're protected. Um, and uh, that day, right there at Ground Zero, 2,977 people died. In one day, we know that it was a total of 2,996 people died. But it's interesting is the Trade Center, the, the Twin Towers, um, you know, they symbolize global, globalization in America's economic power and prosperity. Forty eight countries represented in those towers, companies, businesses, and and it was the icon of success and economic power and when these buildings came down um, you know it told it, it taught us a lot and when they rebuilt the one uh, one trade center the the freedom tower what they call it um, they built it to the height of, of 1766 feet high and the reason they did that was because they didn't want a building that was going to represent economic power but they wanted a building that was going to represent unity, who we are, our core values. And the 1,776 feet high is uh, the birth um, of our nation, the Declaration of the Independence in 1776, um, that when a nation under God, that when we trust God, in God we trust, they realized that, look, you know what, here we are, we build these two monuments to ourselves um, as economic pride, um, but we need one tower, not two. And we must remember that our nation was founded on God. And let's remember it is the Lord who blesses. We are a blessed nation, and it is him, it is he who has blessed um, our nation, and not only our nation, but he's blessed you and I. That you're privileged to live here and to be here, to be born in, in America and to have a job, amen, to have money. Uh, and listen to me, we must remember that, that our, our wealth, it comes from God. And we need to honor God and we need to remember. And let's not forget what happened in 2001. Because we're not out of the woodwork yet. And we need to be mindful that Whatever happens tomorrow, God is in control. He is in, always in control. David, if you would pray, ask God to bless the tithe, the offering, and the gift and the giver, if you will. Amen. Let's sing Jehovah Jireh tonight. Jehovah Jireh, my provider is crazy sufficient. Show give his angels charge over thee, Jehovah. 
Praise God. Thank you, musicians, singers. I really appreciate your ministry tonight. Um, and so I do want to thank you for praying for my wife. Um, you know, she's there in the hospital right now. She's uh, being induced. Um, and she says, you go, you preach. I'll be here. And uh, you know what? If the baby's coming, I'll call you. But preach short. And I said, I, absolutely, I'll preach short, amen. So you're blessed tonight, amen. You're going to say, Pastor, I was telling someone before service, uh, you're going to be like, Pastor, you need to have more kids. So hang on, amen. As I, again, you know what, um, let's let the word of God help us tonight, amen. And again, let's um, allow him to minister to us. Um, and so Romans 3, the old story goes, there was a, a Roman Catholic priest in Belgium, he it was in the days where the word of God was what you would call chained to the pulpit. It wasn't allowed to be in the hands of many people. And there was an attack on the King James Bible at the time. And a Catholic priest, he rebuked the young woman and, and her brother for reading that bad book. And he was pointing to the Bible. And the lady responds and she replied, she says, Mr. Priest, a little while ago, my brother was an idler, a gambler, a drunker, and made such a noise in the house that no one could stay in it since he began to read the Bible. He works with industry, goes no longer to a tavern, no longer touches cards, and brings home money to his poor old mother, and our life at home is quiet and delightful. How come, Mr. Priest, that a bad book produces such good fruit? When it comes to the Bible, to the word of God, people, they can say all they want about the Bible. They can question it. They can deny it. They can mock it. And even perhaps um, they can reject it. But one thing is true. And that one thing that cannot be denied uh, is the fruit of God's word that it bears in the lives uh, of men and women who read it. Many people, they try to argue it. The, 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 they question it, they, the testimony of the Bible, but it was the old evangelist of the early 1900s, Gypsy Smith. He told of a man who, he said that he had received no inspiration from the Bible, and although he had gone through it several times, um, let it go through you once, replied Smith, and then you will tell a different story. That those who have the word of God, listen, they don't realize that the advantage um, that you have. Um, here's the reality tonight, church. Um, when it comes to having the word of God, the Bible, um, it's not only those who are saved and are living for God who have an advantage, but it's just those who follow its principles also receive blessing. Consider our country. Founded upon God, biblical principles, how blessed we are. You travel the world, you know, it's obvious when you leave to another nation. Um, you know, we were there in, in the Middle East and Asia. You know, you can tell a totally difference um, from a nation who believes in the Bible from a nation that doesn't. The blessed, how blessed our nation is. And here is Paul. He is saying in, in what we're going to be reading tonight, um, and I want to talk to you about the advantage of having the word of God. Paul, in his 20 years of ministry so far, here we are in Romans. We went through the book of Acts, uh, and here we are in Romans, 20 years of ministry. Um, and here is uh, Paul the apostle. He begins to answer some questions, um, you know, and doubts um, that many people ask, um, and uh, that many, we have to be, ready to give an answer. If you're a preacher of the gospel or a witness, sir, I want to tell you, there's going to come a time, there's been many times in my ministry where people, they've sat down with me in my office, uh, they've called me and they've questioned what I was preaching. But that's okay. As long as you're ready for the answers and ready for me to show you through scripture. This is what the apostle Paul was going through. Romans 3 Verse 1, let's read together. Paul says, What advantage then has the Jew, or what is the prophet of circumcision? Much in every way, chiefly because to them were committed the oracles of God. For what if some did not believe? Will their unbelief make the faithfulness of God without effect? Certainly not, indeed. 
Let God be true, but every man a liar, as it is written, that you may be justified in your words and may overcome when you are judged. But if our unrighteousness demonstrates the righteousness of God, what shall we say? Is God unjust who inflicts wrath? I speak as a man, certainly not. But then how will God judge the world? For if the truth of God has increased through my lie to his glory, why am I also still judged as a sinner? And why not say, let us do evil that good may come, as we are slanderously reported, and as some affirm that we say their condemnation is just. Father, help us tonight, God, that we would develop a hunger, a desire for your word. We thank you for your word tonight. Give us, God, inspiration, revelation, and wisdom, and help us. In Jesus' name we pray, and all God's people would say, Amen. Amen. I want to look first of all and talk about the advantage of of having the word of God. And so let's remember tonight the apostle Paul, he is building a case against man that is that all man is guilty before God. He deals with God's sovereignty and man's responsibility before God. The first two chapters in Romans um, that we looked at is the argumentation that people give to justify their sin or to hide their sin. Um, And Paul is saying that man on that day, on judgment day, that the wrath of God is going to be fully revealed. um, That not one man um, will be able to stand and claim ignorance um, of not knowing on judgment day. um, Because you see in chapter 1, Paul, he spoke about the unrighteous heathen or the pagan. The immoral man who dives into all gross sins and immorality and idolatry. He is the one um, who doesn't want God. He's the one that shakes his fist at God. Um, He resists God. Um, And um, Paul is saying on that day that that man, um, he will not be able to say he didn't know the truth. Because Paul said you knew the truth, but you suppressed the truth. You didn't want to hear the truth. You locked the truth away um, and you declared um, that you are your own God, you are your own self, um, and you choose not to believe. And God said you are going to be judged. He says you have creation that teaches you that there is a God. That the heathen, even though he doesn't have a preacher to preach to him, Paul says, creation, you walk outside your house and you look at the world around you, the world tells you there's a creator. It is your job to find out who that creator is. Get to know him. This is what God is saying. Paul is saying um, that you are without excuse. Um, and we looked in chapter 2 that Paul, that he's not only talking to the heathen, is remember the world um, it, it is group, it's in three groups of people. The heathen, um, then he talks about the moralist or the religious man. He's the man who tries to wiggle his way um, out of the condemnation that Paul, he's bringing against all men, that we are all sinners, we're all guilty. um, The religious, the moralist, the self-righteous man, um, he doesn't see himself as guilty. He points um, to the heathen, um, he points to the sinner, um, and he looks at what they're doing um, and and looks at them in in despicable ways, um, and he looks at their immorality, and here is Paul, He says, you point fingers at all these people because of what they're doing, and you're just as bad. Just because you're not doing them physically. You're a hypocrite. You're a self-righteous hypocrite. You look at other people and their problems, and you say, I'm not as bad as them. And Paul says, you really are. You who judge another are guilty of the same. Paul talked about that in the very beginning in chapter 2. He says the very sins that you spot in others are the very sins you're practicing. You may not commit physical adultery, but you're entertaining fantasies in your mind. You're committing adultery in your heart. You may not be out committing murder, Paul would say, but you're out there and you're murdering your brother in your heart. And Paul says it's just the same. And so in chapter 2, he talks about the the self-righteous hypocrite, um, and he says that you're doing the very same thing, and your conscience condemns you, and you know it's true. You know you're doing wrong. To the unrighteous heathen, 
In chapter 1, he says, creation condemns you. To the self-righteous hypocrite, he says, your own conscience condemn you. And then at the end of chapter 2, he talks about the super-righteous Hebrew who say, we have the law. And Paul says, you boast about having the law. It's as someone who says, I know the Bible. I know the word of God. And Paul says, you boast in that, but yet you don't even do what the law says. You don't follow the law. You don't obey the law. You actually disregard the law. Jesus says, um, you obey the laws of man rather than the laws of God. And so this brings us to chapter 3. We will look for a few minutes, and I promise. Eight verses. And he's talking about the advantages that we have um, by just having the word of God. Chapter 3, we're, this is the last condemning sermon, amen, that we're going to hear, you know, out of Paul. Everything else is going to be beautiful next week and moving on to chapter 15 of Romans. But if you could just hang on tonight, amen, and make it through this. But this is Paul's bringing this case against man. And he says, look, he says, you have an advantage because here is the, the Hebrew, the Hebrew man. He says to himself, well, well, what's the point, Paul? You're saying that I'm just like the heathen? I'm just like a moralist, just like a, a common, ordinary man. You're putting all of us in the same, you know, and, and it's like, you know, there's no difference between the Hebrew And in verse 1, Paul, he asks questions. And these are questions, no doubt, that you would read in these eight verses. You would find the questions in verse 1, verse 3, verse 5, and verse 7. And the answer is in the even numbers as he gives the answer. And there are questions that, no doubt, Paul, he's heard and been asked and no doubt remember Paul was a Hebrew he was a Pharisee at one time that he no doubt wrestled with in the word of God you know when he became a Christian and a follower of Jesus and so he understands the way man thinks because not all man thinks the same that you can come into the house of God and hear a sermon and you can get something totally different sometimes it's the opposite from what I'm preaching Paul says, the Hebrew will say, what advantage then has the Jew, or what is it profit, what is the profit of circumcision? In other words, the Hebrew is saying, wait a minute, if you're saying we're on the same level as the brethren or the hypocrite, if we're all on the same boat, then what's the advantage of God giving us circumcision, God giving us Judaism? And Paul, he responds in verse 2, he says, much more in every way, chiefly because to them were committed the oracles of God. Notice he doesn't answer the question about circumcision. He already dealt with that at the end of chapter 2. He gets right to the point, um, and he says, because circumcision is of the heart, not of the flesh, but he says chiefly or firstly, um, or in other words, it begins with, um, or um, this is where it starts. This is the foundation. Um, he says the advantage that you have that you are a Hebrew is you have the word of God. You have the Bible. That is the oracles of God. That's what it means. It's the revelation of God. It's the revealing of God. And he says, you were given the oracles. You were entrusted um, with the scriptures granted in chapter 2. Um, he says, you did not keep the commandment. Um, he says, that was given to you. But nonetheless, Paul says, the advantage was uh, you had access to the truth. In other words, if you have a Bible... You have an advantage, is what he's saying. And even though you missed the point to the extent that you didn't walk in truth, you were blessed, 
is what Paul was saying. You were entrusted the oracles of God, the word of God. And God spoke through the Jew. He spoke throughout through Abraham, through Isaac and Jacob. He spoke through Moses and David. He spoke through the prophets, through Jeremiah, Isaiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Zephaniah, Zechariah, Amos. He spoke through all of these prophets. They were all Jews. He says, what advantage, even though you didn't obey the word, the advantage was that God spoke to you, that you had the Bible, you had the word of God, and because you had the word of God, you were blessed. Because you adhered to the principles of God's word, there was blessing. Historically, we see this played out with the Jewish people. Again, they missed the point of what Paul was saying. As Paul was saying was the law was a schoolmaster to teach us how sinners and wicked we are. But they didn't grasp it. But even though they missed the, the main point, um, he said you had the principles. When they were put into practice, um, certain blessings came their way. In the Middle Ages, consider this. When the Black Plague um, swept across the continent of Europe, uh, one, out of er one out of three people were killed by the Black Plague. The Jewish people were virtually untouched. And this caused some real repercussions amongst the Jews because the Jews, they, they were not being wiped out. And, you know, and people were wondering, why is it that the Jewish people, you know, are doing, what, what's going on? It's like, did they do this to us? Because none of them are getting sick from the Black Plague. Was it that they were walking with God? Absolutely not, they were not. They, matter of fact, rejected Jesus Christ. But you know what the Jew had and the reason why they escaped the Black Plague? Was because of their dietary laws. Because of the Bible. That they were blessed because of... That these, the people, they had cleansing laws that they got from the Bible. They took Leviticus and they practiced it. They had the ceremonial cleansing laws and, and the dieting and what to eat and what not to eat because the Jew simply just obeyed what and, and followed the principles in the Bible, they escaped the black, the plague, the black death. Think about this. They were blessed because those principles that God gave to them, they work. Whether or not you're close to the Lord or walking close to God or whether you believe in him, the principle works. You know, electricity works for a Christian and a heathen, either way, it's a principle. Right? The electricity turns on for a sinner or a saint. It doesn't matter. Gravity works on every man. And a person who understands certain principles and utilizes them regardless of what spiritual state they're in, they're blessed. Because that's the word of God. There was a book called None of These Diseases by Dr. McMillan. And he talked about the Jewish people and because of they, you know, even though that they, they're, they're, they're as, as heathen as they are. But if you look at, at the, the health, how healthy they are. By simply just following the Bible. Why do the Jews do so well when it comes to money? You know, we can give them a hard time. Oh, y'all business people. And trust me, I know our last landlord was a Jew. I don't know how many yelling matches that we've had. They're exhausting. But nevertheless, they're, they're blessed financially. And you see that, you know, it's the principles that you can just take. Many secular motivational books are plagiarizing the Bible and claiming, I'll give you 10 steps to success. Just read your Bible. You don't have, save money. Don't buy that book. They're taking the ideas from the word of God. 
and the world is succeeding. And yet Christians will not read their Bible. And Paul says, because the Jew says, well, what's the point? What advantage? What advantage is it to be a Hebrew? What advantage is it? And Paul says there's a great advantage because y'all were given the Bible, the word of God. If you grew up in a Christian home, whether you're a believer or not, you benefited from Christian parents. You were protected. You hear people's testimonies, and you're like, man, that's crazy. I would have, you've been through that, and I've never experienced that. Homeschool. See, Paul is saying, you may not think much, what big deal is it being a Jew? But you must understand, you were committed, the oracles of God. We see our country, many saw the debate last night. Policies. I mean, no, we don't need any more policies. We need revival. Or as one young boy, he said it very well, we need a re-Bible. We need to get the Bible back. The word of God back. It doesn't matter who's in office in November. We're going to keep going down the slippery slope, down and down and down and down until the word of God, amen, is, is finally and, and it, it is starting to be read and starting to be put into practice. It's the word of God. 300 public schools nationwide. I picked up this article the other day. It says that they're... they're that in America, 300 public schools in 12 states with 35,000 students are, have been enrolled this year that they're going to start teaching the Bible in the schools again. Amen. That's good news. Amen. That is very good news. When I read that, I said, praise God, because when the Bible was taken out of school, teen pregnancies and drug abuse and violence and school shootings, all of these things begin to happen when you take the Bible out. God says, if we bless Israel... God will bless us. See, these are principles. So let's look at objecting the Bible. Close with this. Because here's Paul. He says, we have an advantage. We have the word of God. In verse 3, he raises the question that is always asked and argued. And that is in verse 3, says, For what if some did not believe with their unbelief make the faithfulness of God without effect? In other words, they're saying the Hebrew says, okay, yeah, we have the Bible, but what if we don't believe the Bible? What if we don't accept it? We object. See? Testing. And so here, can you hear me now? And so here, here we see that, you know, they say, oh, if we, don't, if, if we don't believe in the Bible, but does that make the principles of none effect? But verse 4 says, certainly not. Indeed, let God be true, um, but every liar as it is written that you may be justified in your words um, and may overcome when you are judged. In other words, what if a people, the Hebrews or Americans, were entrusted to Scripture but do not believe in them? Does it make it invalid? Does this prove God to be a liar. And I love Paul. He uses the Bible to answer the question. And this is very important for us, amen, as we get ready to close, that we understand something, that the mindset, the questions that are being asked, um, that here is Paul, that the people say, what if we believe it? We don't believe in the Bible, that it's not true. Um, does that mean that God's a liar? And Paul said, what, what kind of questions are these? But people really do ask those questions. And the advantage we have of the word of God is we are able to combat those questions. But in reality, it only proves that God is right. Because God says there will be some who will not believe. Some who will reject the word. And so in reality, just because you don't believe in the Bible doesn't make it not true. And one man said, God said it, and that settles it. 
right? And you know what? That's exactly what it is. God said it, and we and it settles it. Paul says, if you say they don't, they, you know, here's what, what happens is people say, I tried it. I've tried to pray. I had my devotions in the morning, and nothing happened. I read the Bible like the man who said, I read it four times, and I went through it four times. An evangelist responded and says, how about you stop going through it and let it go through you one time, and it will change the whole story. And so what happens, people say, I prayed, I fasted, I read this, but I didn't see God move. And Paul says, are you calling God? Paul says, I have a choice to either believe you or God. And I believe God. And Paul says, you're a liar. Because the Bible says in James 4, 8, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. But if you draw near to God, God will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, uh, you double-minded. In other words, uh, he's saying, uh, if, if I draw nigh to God, God will draw nigh to me. If, if God doesn't draw nigh to me, then it's not God's fault. It's my fault. And Paul is saying, listen, um, you know what? Let God be true and every man a liar. His word is true. Uh, that is why we're able to say with confidence when people, they, they're trying to, they're struggling, they're going through things. I can say, seek God, uh, because if you seek him, you will find him. But I prayed. I read my Bible. And nothing happened. Let God be true. And every man a liar. Paul says, you're, you're lying. Paul says, it's impossible. If you truly saw God, it, maybe you're not waiting on him. You prayed and you got up. All right, God, you got five minutes. Move in five minutes. Or you know what? I'm just going to real quick and read. Paul says, you're, you're a liar. Now, don't do that to people, amen. You know, that ain't going to work well with you. But here's Paul the apostle. He says, there's no way because God will move on your behalf. Consider, remember, he quotes Habakkuk, right? The just shall live by faith, right? And, and he pulls out, even Habakkuk says, I will stand my watch and set myself on the rampart. And I will watch to see what he will say to me and what I will answer when I am corrected. Here's Habakkuk. Habakkuk, his name means to embrace or hug or one translation or definition means cuddles. Imagine your name means cuddles. I name my son Cuddles when he's born tonight. <laughs> Come here, Cuddles. But it's a perfect, uh, you know, it fits his name, Habakkuk, because he trusts in God's word. It's like it comforts him. He says, I'm going to go into my tower and I'm going to wait. I'm going to seek him and wait and see what he will say to me. He already knows by faith if I go seek him, he's going to speak to me. And if I come down from my tower and say he didn't speak to me, he's not real. I'm a liar because I didn't wait on him. In verse 2, then the Lord answered me and said, write the vision and make it plain on tablets uh, that he may run who reads it. We can tell People who seek the Lord, amen, uh, because those are the ones uh, who you see their life, uh, you see the fruits of it, uh, you see God uh, speaking to them and through them and helping them. It's those uh, who trust in his word. And then he says, for if the truth of God has increased through my life, his glory, why am I also still judged a sinner? And why not say, let us do evil for that good may come as we are slanderously reported and some affirm that we say their condemnation is just. And, and here's Paul. He's, it's an argumentation that happens uh, constantly. And Paul says at the end, uh, we're all at sinners. That's what if for all have sinned, fallen short of the glory of God. So here is Paul. In verse 1 through 8. The questions. We try to wiggle our way out of. Not knowing, and Paul says, no, you know. You know. Because to the sinner, the unbeliever, creation testifies. To the moralist and the religious, your conscience. And to the Hebrew, the law 
testifies against you. He says, your advantage is you have the word of God. I want you to put this picture up. I close with this. Here is a Bible that has been melted into steel that they found this in 2002 as they're digging through the rubble on 9-11. Consider this article and we'll pray. He says, we've all heard it was said that the word of God is mighty, all powerful and everlasting. In 2 Timothy 3.16, Paul asserted that the Bible is God breathed, meaning God had a hand in everything that was written in it. And God still speaks actively to people as they read the Bible today. But when horrific tragedy hits and instances like what happened to the World Trade Center on 9-11, many find it difficult to hold firm to that truth. Even as Christians, we often question, how is it that a loving God will allow such evil and mass chaos? Though we may lack understanding of God's ways in extracting beauty from the broken world, it is quite all inspiring when he sends us undeniable messages of hope amidst the devastation. Times like these remind us that the Bible is a living word and it is true. Such was the case when one firefighter was sifting through the rubble on ground zero after 9-11 attacks on the Twin Tower in March 2002. He was, he was with a crew sorting through the rubble and remnants of, of the South Tower when he made an unthinkable discovery, a Bible in our midst. A Bible in our midst. He says, we found it fused to a chunk of steel. Strangely, pages from 9-11, a Bible remained. And the page of the Bible was open to what was particularly interesting. It said, in shock, the firefighter immediately brought the treasure, um, uh, who was the photographer assigned to work on the ground zero for nine months. He, too, was there in the South Tower looking through the rubble, seeking artifacts and archives. Um, uh, the, this shredded, burned, and rubble-covered co Bible came to me from the loving hands of a fireman who knew that I was the recorder-keeper of Ground Zero, said the photographer, according to the New York Times. It said the author of Aftermath, World Trade Center Archive, was totally speechless when his eyes fell upon the Bible verse exposed on the surface of, of what he called the harp-shaped Bible fused in, 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 in steel. Of all the chapters and verses in the Bible, the Bible was open to guess what? Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, um, and I'll read it from the Bible. They didn't even put the verse in that news article. I was fast. But it says, um, again, you have heard, oh, he says in verse um, 38, um, uh, he says, you have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you not to resist an evil person, but whoever slaps you on the right cheek, turn the other to him also. That here it is that as these firefighters and these, as they're going through the rubble, they're finding body parts. And, you know, and you can only imagine the anger in them. And he was saying how God in the midst of rubble. How he spoke to them. The page was fused to steel. You know, steel gets hot. Thousands. Of, a piece of steel to be that sharded, that meant that piece of steel had to have been thousands of degrees hot. And yet the Bible didn't burn. It was fused to the steel. I want to tell you, we live in a world, amen, chaos. We don't know the future. But we have an advantage, church, the word of God we have. And we have to lay it close to our hearts because it doesn't matter. Richard Warmbrand was put in prison for preaching the gospel. He lived off of one verse for three years. No matter how they beat him, tormented him, brought his son to the prison, brought his wife. But he lived off the word of God. It didn't matter what happened. We have an advantage, church. We don't have to crumble. We don't have to fall. We don't have to backslide. We don't have to be distracted. Amen. If we have, and this is what Paul is saying, we have the word of God and the principles that God's word has given us. We have an advantage. I want every 
head bowed and every eye closed. Not only do we have an advantage, we have a warning. The word of God is a warning. And he said, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. You can read on your own time, verses 9 through 20. We're not going to look at that, but read on your own time. What Paul was building the case that no man would be able to stand before God. We're helpless. And it's meant to bring us to a place to say, I need a savior. There's no way I can be saved. And Jesus steps right in and says, I can save you. I'm the only one who is worthy. My blood. This was the whole three chapters we looked at, amen, in Romans. Paul showing us how dark our heart is, how wicked we are. But how much we need a savior. A man cannot be saved if he doesn't see that he's lost and he's drowning and he's on his way to hell. He thinks he's right with God because his parents went to church or he knows the Bible. You're here tonight. You're not a Christian. You're not born again. You're not a follower of Jesus. And you would say, Pastor, I want to pray and receive Christ in my heart. Raise your hand if that's you. I want to pray for you. I want to believe God with you tonight. Yes, God sees that hand. God bless you. You want to accept Christ. God sees that hand. You want to say, Jesus, I want you to come into my heart. I want you to be my Savior. God sees that hand. Amen. You're backsliding away from God. You're not right with God. We're moving quickly. Amen. You want to get right with God. Brother who lifted their hand, if you would do one more thing, if you would please come to the front. We want to pray for you. Yes. Amen. You come. You are making a statement that I want to receive Christ. My brother is going to pray for you. Amen. Tonight. Amen. God bless you, brother. He's going to pray for you. Okay. He's going to lead you into a prayer. Let's stand to our feet. We're going to sing that song. This I believe. As we sing that out, altars are open. You come. Amen. Pray. God, give me a heart, a, 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 an appetite for the word of God to love your word. Um, Lord, that your word um, will be etched into my heart and my life. Um, pray, amen. God, give me a hunger desire. David, he said, your word is a light unto my path and a lamp unto my feet. Tonight, you're confused. You don't know what to do. The word of God, amen, has all the answers. The word of God is living. It's powerful. It's not just a book. It's a powerful book. It's a spiritual book. Paul says, our advantage is we have the Bible. Thank you, Jesus, for your word. Thank you, Lord, for giving us your word tonight. Yes, Father, we thank you for your grace, your mercy. We thank you for your power, Lord God. Lord, let your word bring healing, God, to every heart tonight, God. Oh, your word, your resurrection power.
la la mari con boborro boborre e la marianda rabashe amen jesus said heaven and earth will pass away but my words will by no means pass away his word lives forever read your bible i encourage you as you read the word of god you will develop an appetite because it's living it's powerful and i encourage you read the book of romans we made it through this and i encourage you amen allow it amen to change your heart and and, and the holy spirit amen to speak to you and let it fit your life amen we're going to dismiss tonight Again, street preaching tomorrow, 7 p.m. Keep my wife in prayer, amen, as we're, and, and God's hand to be upon her and, our, and baby Michael. And so let's bow our heads in prayer. We're going to dismiss them. As we dismiss, I'm going to ask Ricardo if you could just lift your voice uh, and dismiss us tonight. Amen. Praise God. Amen.